As consumers, we have all dealt with issues. Maybe you went to a restaurant and they gave you the wrong food. Maybe you bought furniture and it was missing screws, or one of the pieces wasn't the right length. Those are all issues that we have dealt with as the consumer. In the manufacturing environment, there are also customer issues as well. That is primarily what quality engineers deal with. I was a quality engineer for a year and a half, so I have some experience with this issue. In this video, I'll discuss customer issues and how they are handled. So the general process is this. The customer will find a nonconformity. A nonconformity is an item that doesn't meet the standard. It could be a visual nonconformity. It could be a dimensional nonconformity. It could pose a safety hazard. And these are the worst kind of issues. It could be the wrong item entirely. You'll also notice the line I have grouping all of these together. The issue could be any combination of all these items. So the customer will find a nonconformity. Oftentimes, bad parts will slip through and they won't even catch them. But for the times that they do catch them, the quality department of the customer will contact the quality department of the supplier. So that's where we get into customer quality versus supplier quality. My role was primarily in customer quality. So I would deal with our customers. That means that we were the supplier to them. The joke is customer quality is a lot more extreme than supplier quality. Just like in any other industry like the service industry, customer service can be a hectic job. You can deal with a lot of angry customers and a lot of crazy demands. So the joke is kind of that supplier quality has a much easier job or less stressful. Because if you're dealing with your suppliers, you as the customer, you have the power. You can kind of put threats on them and make demands of them. Now at the company itself, the customer quality department and the supplier quality department will have to work together on occasion. There might be an occasion where you have a customer issue and you discover that the reason that issue occurred wasn't even due to your company. It was due to your supplier. So that's an example of when internally the customer quality and the supplier quality would have to work together. So the customer catches the issue. The first thing they're going to do is issue a supplier trouble report. This is also known as a customer corrective action report. It can be called a CAR, which is a corrective action report, a CTR, a customer trouble report, or a SCAR. There's all sorts of acronyms, but they all mean the same thing. And what makes it even more confusing sometimes is customer quality always works with supplier quality. So if someone is giving you an issue, it's the supplier quality of that company. So they'll probably call the form a supplier quality issue. But from your company's point of view, it's a customer issue. So although customer quality and supplier quality are two different areas of a company, they pretty much do the same job, just from reverse sides. One department's focused on issuing corrective action reports. The other part of the department is focused on receiving them. So the customer quality is all about fixing your issues that you've given to your customers, whereas supplier quality is all about fixing the issues that your supplier gave to you. So they use a lot of the same terminology, and they have kind of the same thought process. They just stand on different sides. So as customer quality, as soon as you receive an issue, you're going to put it into your system. But immediately after that, you need to contain the issue. You need to put immediate containment into place. Containment is also known as a knee-jerk reaction. It's a firefighting reaction. It's a, oh crap, we have bad parts. Let's make sure no more get to the customer. So this containment takes the form of third-party sorting. And there's whole companies that rely on this business. That's pretty much just a company whose sole job is to go into your customer or to come into your company and just sort through parts. You give them work instructions, you know, and visual clues to look for and say, here's what's wrong. Sort through all the parts we've made in this set time frame and decide which ones are good and which ones are bad. You can also do that internally and it's a lot cheaper. So you sort what the customer has, you sort what you just made, but you also have to make sure items in your supply chain are taken care of. So this involves a lot of phone calls to trucking companies or the person at your company who handles logistics. Because when it comes to sorting, you want to end it as soon as possible. 
but you have to make sure you get to a clean point. And a clean point is when you've sorted through all potentially bad items. And you're only going to know this if you know where all your parts are at in the supply chain. So you got to talk to people. Once you've contained the problem, you're going to have to fix it. But to fix a problem, you have to know what caused it. This is known as root cause analysis. You want to get down to the core issue that caused the problem, the root cause. And there's all sorts of books and instructions and processes for determining root cause analysis, or for determining the root cause. Here's some general methods you'll see a lot. You'll see the 5Y approach, and this is really the annoying little kid approach, because you literally just say, why did this happen? Well, why did that happen? Well, why did that happen? And then eventually you get to a good stopping point and you say, oh, this is why the issue happened. That's your root cause. But that's usually when you kind of know where the problem's headed. For more general areas where you're not really sure what caused the problem, you can do a fishbone diagram, which is also known as an Ishikawa diagram. And usually with Ishikawa fishbone diagrams, you'll typically see five or seven categories used. And the rule of thumb is they usually start with M. So there's kind of branches, a bone of the fish. You can say, here are all the possible machine problems that could have caused this nonconformity. Here are all the possible issues with man. So that's your workers, men and women. Here is all the possible methods that could have messed us up. Or our measurement system. And you go through these five or seven different M's to kind of figure out what area caused the problem. I believe I mentioned four of them. There's also management, that'd be a fifth one. There's mother nature, so environmental issues, and that's six. I can't think of the seventh one, but a quick Google search, you'll find your five or seven M's. Material, that's the seventh M. You also have something called an 8D, which is not really a problem solving methodology. It's typically a form you have to fill out for a lot of customers. It's very heavily used in the auto industry which is the industry I worked in for a year and a half as a quality engineer. So you see all sorts of customer issues in the automotive industry. There's also the plan, do, check, act approach. This is more so just a general approach that industrial engineers use for anything. Plan something, perform it, check to see how well you did, and then act on that data to improve it. I wouldn't really say it's a good problem solving tool. Then there's something called the failure modes effects analysis. This is a really useful tool if you already have this document completed. And I'll do a separate video on how to create this document. Because this document talks about all potential issues and what would happen if they went wrong. But if you don't have this document, you can't use it. All right, so it's great for me to say, use these problem solving approaches. And here's the general process. But in reality, as a quality engineer or anyone solving these problems, you're not going to have a lot of the technical know-how. And you're not going to know a lot of the operators very well to understand what kind of processes they're following. Not generally, anyway. Nobody knows everything. And that's why teamwork is so critical. So here's the way three main functions of a facility work together to determine the root cause. If you're filling out these customer corrective action reports, you're going to be in quality. So your role is going to be collaboration with production and engineering, form completion to send back to the customer to let them know your countermeasures are successful, and the countermeasure is what you implemented to fix the problem. You're the customer contact. Production who's making the parts and engineering who's designing things, they don't want to deal with the customer, and that's not their job. That's quality's job, generally. So production consists of the operators making the parts, supervisors handling the day-to-day -day operations and the operators, maintenance who helps fix uh, a lot of the machines, a lot of the issues. A lot of times you'll need maintenance to implement your countermeasures. A lot of times with your countermeasures you'll have a new process that needs to be put into place. Not only will the problem require a mechanical fix, but sometimes the process itself will change a little bit and you have to reflect this in the work instructions. These are all good items to have as evidence to show the customer. And anytime a process is changed, you're going to have to do retraining. On the engineering side, you'll have to go to engineering for them to design the countermeasures typically. 
If it's a new part of a machine or some sort of new system, they're going to have to design it. Or to solve for the root cause, they're going to have to do some sort of mechanical analysis or redesign an electrical system. The reason I have all those arrows at the bottom of the screen is to show how all these departments, these different functions of a facility, work together. The place where I worked, it was a pretty small company, so I pretty much knew everyone in these departments, at least on my shift. And that's an important thing to note as well, the soft side of engineering. Really get to know the people you're working with and really build a good rapport with them, and it can go miles in helping you determine root causes. Regardless of how you determine your root cause, and no matter what countermeasure you put into place, you're going to have to fill out a form and send it to your customer. Most of the time. I guess there's a few customers that will take your word for it, but generally you need documentation. Documentation is becoming more and more commonplace in today's world, especially with ISO and other regulations. So in general, the forms have this information that you need to fill out as the supplier. Team members, so that's everyone involved in determining the root cause and implementing the countermeasure. So that would be you filling the form out, any members of engineering you talked to, any supervisors you utilized. You'll want to put the problem description. Uh, initially, this will be filled out by the customer. You're going to have your interim containment. And containment was mentioned earlier. So you're going to complete the containment before you even start working on filling out the form. Of course, the customer is going to want to know the root cause of the problem. They're going to want to know your permanent corrective action, which that is what ends containment. You have to keep sorting through parts until you have something that fixes the problem in the first place, which makes sense. Most of the evidence you include with your corrective action report is all about the corrective action itself, the countermeasure. You're going to need verification of the corrective action. So you're going to need the way to show that the corrective action works and that you're testing to make sure it works on a continual basis. Not all corrective actions require this, but a lot do. Something common to continually test your corrective action to make sure it's still working is something called a red rabbit. A red rabbit is a bad part, a non-conforming part, that you make on purpose, and you identify it usually by painting it a bright red to show it's non-conforming. The red rabbit will be non-conforming in the exact same way that the part that made it to the customer was non-conforming. So say we have a part that's a little too long and there's a whole corrective action process kicked off for it. You implement a countermeasure that prevents a part from being made that long. But to test it, you use some sort of red rabbit that is too long, just like the part the customer originally got. You show that in your machine this part couldn't possibly be made. Some sort of sensor will kick it out and you put that red rabbit into your machine every day to show the sensors are still working. The countermeasure is still effective. The form will also ask for prevention, and the good customers will ask for this too. It's annoying as a supplier because it means more work, but a customer that's really interested in protecting themselves from nonconformities will say, hey, you make other parts for us too. How are you going to prevent this problem from happening in our other parts? Generally in manufacturing, if you have a contract with one customer, you're probably going to win future contracts, or you probably already make multiple parts for them. And a lot of times, the parts are similar, or go through similar processes. So if you've already messed up one part, what's to stop you from messing up another part? So how do you prevent that? Most corrective action forms will also have a closure section. This is pretty much for anything else the supplier wants to mention that's not included in one of the previous sections. So in general, you're going to have to fill out all this information on a corrective action report. So now we're going to talk about maintaining quality issues on a larger scale. We've just covered how to determine a root cause, how to implement a countermeasure, and kind of the general process for how that's done. So once the countermeasure has been implemented and validated, complete the paperwork, which you just learned about what would be on that paperwork, and then email the customer and just do a lot of praying is the joke. Hope the customer is okay with what you sent them. There's a lot of times where you're going to get kickback from the customer. They don't think your countermeasure is good enough. Or they think you need to do more. And this is a back and forth struggle that quality has to deal with quite frequently. But in general, when quality is not dealing with customer corrective actions or helping out supplier quality with supplier corrective actions, 
or even focusing on internal corrective actions. So that's issues you found that haven't made it to the customer yet or the customer's not noticing and they don't care about. In general, you're keeping track of all your issues on a quality issues list. This is kind of the master list where you talk about all the issues you've had for the year. Just some general advice I think that will help with this list. Conditional format in Excel so that some sort of color code can be used for overdue issues, which should be red. That's when you're late. The customer wanted a countermeasure and the form completed. You're not done yet. Uh, color code for in-process issues, so you know those are ones you need to work on, and etc. It's good to keep metrics as well on your quality issues. So, you know, have some sort of matrix where you just use attribute data to keep track of things, you know, ones and zeros. Um, did this have to do with welding? Yes, put a one. Did this have to do with assembly? No, put a zero. Kind of begin collecting data like that on a lot of your issues, and you can kind of begin to see things from the big picture. You know, any company will have a decent amount of quality issues, especially if it's a bigger company. Eventually you'll get to a point where you have hundreds of quality issues documented and general information about them. So you can kind of step back and say, wow, this year we've had a lot of spot welding issues or we've had a lot of plating issues. Say you have chrome plated parts or something. So you can begin to say, okay, we have some sort of system wide problem we need to look at. And if we put in these general fixes, it can prevent a lot of future issues. So having data like that is really useful, especially at an upper management level. So if you have to report a lot to upper management or eventually present something to them, if you can go to them and say, look, we're having a lot of issues with, you know, this sort of welding or this sort of assembly, and it's causing us all of these issues, I recommend we do this to reduce it. That is really something useful to say to upper management. You can really implement change on a wide scale. So even at higher levels too, it's good to record financial cost of quality. Now, writing down the costs of an issue can get complicated and it's good to be conservative. You know, how much did the sort cost? How much were you charged by the customer for having an issue? Those are all pretty easy to track, but there's a lot of soft costs too that you can implement, depending on your company's viewpoint. You know, should you record how long it took you to fix the issue, a rough estimate of your time? Because time is money for every employee. So if you begin recording these financial cost of quality data, you can use this as a motivational tool for management. If you need to get management on your side and have their support, you can say, look, this issue we're having has already cost us $10,000. So I know the fix I'm suggesting might be 20000 but if this fix prevents this $10,000 issue from happening a few more times, it will pay for itself. So that's why cost of quality data can be really useful. In general, the joke with quality is that you want to be put out of your job. You work all the time at your job to implement countermeasures to root cause problems. You're trying to fix things that went wrong and hurt the customer, and you're trying to prevent them from ever happening again. Ideally, if you could fix all the issues, you wouldn't need a quality department, at least not for customer relations, because you would never have nonconformities. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you now understand a lot more about how the quality department functions.